Welcome everyone to the Maryland Native Plant Society webinar. Our program tonight is Making Central Appalachian Forests More Resilient, Restoring Late Successional Forest Structure with uh, Dr. Pavoda Galgamua, PhD of the Nature Conservancy in the Western Maryland office. My name is Ann DeNovo and I'll be your host this evening. We also have with us this evening, Donnell Keach, who is the Resilient Forest Program Director for the Nature Conservancy, Dr. Pavoda Galgamua, PhD. He's the Forest Science Project Manager of the Maryland DC chapter of the Nature Conservancy. He earned a Bachelor of Science in Agricultural Technology and Management and a Master's in Science in Environmental Forestry from the University of Paradania in Sri Lanka. He then came to the United States and earned a second Master's and a PhD in Horticulture and Natural Resources from Kansas State University. He works out of the Nature Conservancy's Cumberland, Maryland office where he designs and implements collaborative science-based forestry projects that contribute to making Central Appalachian forests healthier and more resilient. And now, Paboda, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, and just... Uh... Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction, and I have I appreciate your time and attention, everyone. So in uh, today's presentation, I will be sharing with you very briefly how the Nature Conservancy is using the resilient and connected landscape science to focus our forest conservation and management at landscape scale to ensure habitat connectivity across the Appalachians and make the Appalachian forests more resilient to climate change. And, and I'll be mostly talking about one of our managing projects in Western Maryland, restoring late succession of forest structure. The, the Appalachians are one of the last great places for biodiversity globally. The region's diverse topography has uh, resulted in a broad range of microhabitats, which ultimately secures a high level of biological diversity. This map provides a picture of areas that uh, represents concentrations of limited range species and highlighting locations that are essentially irreplaceable and uh, which presents conservation opportunities that are found in very few other places. As we all face the challenges of adapting to the changes in climate, connectivity and climate resilience will be critical for, climate, for wildlife and all sorts of living creatures in the region and beyond. Therefore, we need to give nature's biodiversity all the help we can give. This, this animation uh, illustrates a predicted pathways for rain shifts for species, the options they'll have given the current land use and projected climate change scenarios. Note that uh, the central lapse is a, a super highway of movement for species circled in this red circle and, uh, and Western mainland cuts right, right across the main part of this flow, which signifies that Western mainland is a critical link in the chain. And if forests in Western mainland are lost or degraded, it will have a negative impact on nature of the entire region. The Nature Conservancy's vision here is to conserve the network of resilient connected lands so that nature and people adapt and thrive as climate changes. When I say conservation, it's, it's a combination of legal protection and improved management in both public and private lands. So given our understanding of resilient and connected landscapes as key to climate adaptation. The goal of our resilient forest program in Maryland is to conserve the Maryland's priority conservation corridor through the Appalachians. We, we recognize that uh, climate change is a global challenge. 
Maryland DC chapter is part of a bigger story. Our, our resilient forest program delivers benefits to nature and people in Western Maryland, but, but also it adds up to bigger outcomes in the Appalachians and ultimately contributes to the Nature Conservancy's global conservation priorities. Our current work plan include a diverse portfolio of projects that are interrelated and reinforcing, backed by science, implemented by an interdisciplinary team and builds on the relationships to influence and support partners, both public and private, to have a landscape scale conservation impact. So, so as we advance these projects, we thrive to increase forest health and connectivity in Western Maryland. So one might think, why do we need to manage forests? It's, it's true that if you drive or hike through the mountains of Western Maryland or West Virginia, the forest looks lovely. But ecologists and foresters agree that most of the forests across the Appalachians are stressed and vulnerable. So this conceptual diagram show the proportions of forest and age class distributions in, in the past over three periods, pre-European settlement, the 19th and early 20th century and the current condition. So if you can, you can see in its pre-settlement condition, which is represented by this dashed line, Eastern forests in general were dominated by old growth conditions, forests that were more than hundred years old with lots of that structural diversity and only about 10%, the, the forest in that young class of 10 to 20 years old. So studies show that these pre-colonial landscapes were highly complex and a full range of successional stages or standard classes would have been represented. But old growth used to be the predominant forest type in Appalachia, similar to throughout the Eastern US because of the infrequency of large high intensity disturbances. By the late 19th to early 20th century, land was cleared so much that very little was left in the old growth category. A huge landscape scale transformation occurred during this era of exploitation. And, and this is the period where open agricultural or early succession habitats were widely presented in the region. However, trees started to regrow after a whole scale harvest across the region. So the large scale recovery of Eastern forests after undergoing years of intense logging and land clearance for agriculture is a, is a remarkable example of forest ecosystem resilience itself. More than 150 years after the, after the peak agricultural clearing in uh, Eastern US, many forests across the region have reached maturity and some are progressing toward an old growth condition. So as I said, uh, today's forests are recovering and we have this bubble of forest in this middle-aged or mature condition, 40 to 80 years old. After the lands, landscape scale exploitation, the forest in the, in the landscape started to recover in the same time period. So, so most of the forests are more or less in the same age class and lacks the age class and structural diversity, by which I mean um, uh, trees of different ages and sizes and many layers of vegetation in the forest which are the conditions we want to see in a healthy, resilient forest. Additionally, most of these forests have lost genetic diversity and have degraded soils. So the question is, what does this mean? So while conditions before European settlement may not be appropriate as targets for restoration, which is a separate discussion to have, the historical information can still inform goals and strategies by providing reference conditions and an understanding of the variability and the true, true potential of the 
underlying geophysical environment to hold a diverse suite of forests in the landscape. So this situation presents lots of opportunity and uh, lackness of older age class forests beyond the mature stage is noteworthy. So the management project we, we are going to talk about next supports the advancement of forests towards this older condition, which is an improvement for overall forest condition and is a priority for increasing forest, forest resilience. So with that, uh, we transition into the second half of this uh, presentation and uh, talk about uh, one of our management projects among the portfolio of projects for the Resilient Forest Program in Western Mainland, Climate Informed Late Successional Forest Management Project. So before we talk about the specifics of the project, let's see what are these successional stages and how we define or can we define old growth? This is a very simplified illustration of successional stages where after a stand initiating disturbance event, natural or, natural or anthropogenic, it's assumed that a new forest develops by passing through successive and predictable stages, initiating with a grass forb stage and culminating in a late successional or old growth stage. So when the, when the stand reach the old growth stage, dominated by trees generally greater than 140 years old, it will have a well-established understory. There are snags or standing dead trees. All tree ages and heights are represented. And there are plenty of decayed and undecayed logs on the ground. So at this stage, there's a diversity among microhabitats within a forest and variety of habitat options for wildlife. So in summary, you can see that these successive stages create conditions that are favorable for another suite of species and gradually transitions into different conditions. This is succession in, in very simple terms. And there are different viewpoints to this concept and it's complex. There are there are multiple pathways and doesn't always move forward along the succession gradient as simply as that. It goes back and forth multiple times, but this is sufficient to establish a general understanding uh, for our purpose. So what, what image comes to your mind when you hear the term old growth? Too many it describes a forest that has grown for centuries without human disturbance. It contains these massive towering old trees with large decaying trunks. It's not just a forest, it's a charismatic ecosystem. But the, but the truth is there may, never be, um, there may never be a single widely accepted definition for old growth. It, it's hard to generalize as it varies based on climate, the species, the soils, and site history. So due to this variability across the landscape, primary old growth forests take many forms. It, it's not always the cathedral forests that one might imagine. Therefore, given the diversity of forests, it may not be desirable to come up with hard definitions for old growth. Sometimes it's better to keep it vague. As we saw in the previous slide, old growth is is a stage in a forest development, but, but not all forests reach old growthness because in order for a forest to reach old growthness, it has to, it has to escape large scale disturbances for a very long period of time so that the, the, the complexity of an old growth forest will be developed within the forest naturally. The, the trees would reach their maximum lifespan, all stages of age classes and height classes are present. There are standing snags and fallen large logs. The falling massive trees create canopy gaps in the canopy, allowing sunlight to penetrate in, into the forest flow and which, which triggers a new suit of uh, regenerating seedlings to occupy the gap. There's diverse collection of microhabitats providing various multiple habitat options. 
so even even though we need to acknowledge that there's an there's an acceptable range of variation in old growth condition in general defining old growth is particularly useful especially in regulatory terms for specific regions or specific forest types or for a specific purpose uh, agreeing on some criteria to define old growth is important for inventorying stands or to prioritize for protection this was the predominant forest class in many parts of north america before widespread exploitation occurred so, so now we are left with few isolated remnants, which needs to be desig designated and set aside for the sole purpose of conservation. So in that sense, uh, mainland DNR came up with this definition to identify and designate old growth forests in mainland. No doubt there are, there are un undiscovered old growth remains in the region. It's important to identify them for their conservation value alone but uh, but these places would expand our understanding of the of the ecology of old growth forests these are reservoirs of genetic diversity not found elsewhere which is es essential in landscape scale resilience they support unique biologically rich communities and and it also is uh, designated as a key wildlife habitat in, in mainland state wildlife action plan Close to 40% of animal species listed as rare, threatened, and uh, endangered are likely to be limited or benefited from old growth forests. And, uh, and when it comes to climate resilience, uh, older forests are able to store carbon in various pools, including the above ground and below ground pools. And this is the stage of forest development with the highest amount of carbon storage. So, so protecting and conserving true old growth forests is essential. So back to the, my previous uh, things that I told, uh, by trying to define old growth, what we are trying to do is classify a continuous phenomena into categories to better understand them, just because it's too complex for the human mind, not for the, not for the nature though. But we need to acknowledge that forests develop along a continuum via complex pathways. Old growth characteristics don't develop instantaneously at some magical age. They, they occur over time. It takes at least 200 years for, for the full suit of old growth structures to develop. Therefore, in our effort to conserve biodiversity and true old growth forests, we need to consider forests of all development stages beyond old growth. Th so that's what uh, this uh, publication I have put here is about, which is a synthesis of uh, findings from five regional workshops in US, um, I think in uh, 2005 or so. And as described in this report, in general, old growth characteristics begin to emerge when some trees in the stand reach about 100 years of age. And here we see the true old growth zone and the zone of financial maturity where um, current commercial timber management is focused on in, in most places within the general management areas in our public lands. The stands have reached uh, 100-ish years. So, so the zone of financial maturity may extend little over 100 in certain places. Then there is this uh, late successional zone in between the zone of financial maturity and the true old growthness, which according to this report often slips through the coarse field of conservation and are rapidly disappearing as they are beyond the age of maximum commercial value if they are not protected. So the true benefit, the, the true benefit of having old growth forest in the landscape is, is related to the ecosystem services that it provide which is driven by the structural complexity these forests encompass. So what we believe is that uh, these functions or, or complex structures that drives these functions does not have to be restricted to primary tree, true old growth forests, but can be potentially redeveloped over time in secondary forests, uh, in the forests that are in this late succession zone. 
it's, it's important to recover these functions at landscape scale to, to better adapt to future stresses. For, for these reasons, uh, management for all growth features at both standard landscape scale is increasingly seen as a, a potential silvicultural option. And there's an opportunity to shorten the time it takes to create old growth characteristics by, by using forest management in certain places, which could expand, which could expand the area of uh, forest with old growth characteristics in the landscape again beyond the old growth. So, however, again, we need to acknowledge that not every forest stand within this late successional forest, late successional zone uh, will be suitable for this kind of management. All of these forests will develop these characteristics on, it, on their own over time. It would take many decades or sometimes centuries for them to reach old growth mass naturally, which is fine. In many places, any sorts of human interventions would, uh, would further delay this process instead of accelerating. Therefore, we should be really critical and uh, cautious with, with our approach. Hands off management or passive approach would be the best in, in a vast majority of these places. So identifying forest stands where active management can actually accelerate the process is important. As an example, where, uh, where certain stresses such as invasive species, pathogens, fragmentation has degraded the forest condition and it's not progressing forward. So a little help in in terms of well-planned interventions could accelerate this process. This is a challenge. So with this background, uh, we developed this project with the goal of establishing a network of demonstration sites in, in Western mainland to demonstrate the potential to accelerate the development of old growth characteristics in, in Western mainland forests through structural complexity enhancement. Structural complexity enhancement is a menu of silvicultural options or forest management tools trying to emulate natural disturbance dynamics resulting in the multi-age uh, stand structures. Uh, we expect that applying these techniques to manage a portion of secondary forests will be, will be of direct value in our efforts to moderate climate change and have a broad array of ecosystem benefits to humans and other organisms. Structural complexity enhancement or late successional forest restoration is uh, not an entirely new field. This is something that has been scientifically studied and practiced with success in the New England region. I am referring to this pamphlet uh, by Tony Demeto and uh, Paul Canacero on restoring old growth characteristics. So when it comes to late successional restoration, as you can see in this figure, a gradient of restoration practices are available from, from close to passive approach with no timber management objectives to having timber management as the primary objective, but still work towards having oil growth features uh, in the land. As I mentioned earlier, structural complexity enhancement is a menu of options where a multiple combination of practices can be used to restore um, late successional structure in, in particular piece of land. But this depends on the landowner objective. It, it can range from, it can range from just a applying a single practice such as marking and retaining some legacy trees to employing a combination of practices. So we can, we can, see, the, we can see three distinct types of objectives or restoration activity here, where restoration of old growth structures, either the primary objective, which is more closer to the passive approach, it can be a complementary objective, if not a related objective. So the most important thing is long-term planning. So 
in our larger project, we have established two demonstration projects so far covering the first two objectives and uh, scoping for the third one. The first site is at uh, Savage River State Forest. We are restoring, uh, restoring late suctional character is the, is the primary objective and has no timber management objective. Um, active management will be minimum and uh, be close to passive approach. Site, site two is at Sidling Hill Creek Preserve, a TNC preserve where uh, late suctional restoration is a complementary objective. Again, managing for timber is not an objective here. The third site uh, is ideally a partnership with a private landowner and is in the, in the scoping stage where a landowner must agree to have some late, late successional character development in their property and continue to have timber management as their primary objective. So, so remember here, uh, we are, we are neither asking landowners to get into timber management if they are not doing that already in their property. No, we are asking them to move away from timber management or take productive land out of production. So the stars should align here where, where a landowner has existing interest in having old growth features in part of their property. So uh, for the time being, for, in today's presentation, we will just look at our project at Savage River State Forest. So as you know, uh, science and relationships are at the heart of every TNC success story. We are working collaboratively with public land managers in Western Maryland, especially for the first demonstration project at Savage River State Forest. Uh, note that this photo was taken pre-COVID in the, in the summer of 2019, which is, which is nearly impossible these days with the safety measures in place. So we had, um, we had multiple cons conversations with uh, Mailand Forest Service and Mailand Wildlife and Heritage Program partners to, to listen to their concerns and develop some criteria for an acceptable project. Uh, we evaluated all the alternatives we had within public lands to establish a demonstration project and finally came into an agreement on a site at uh, Savage River State Forest in Garrett County. So these sites were proposed to be established within an uh, OGMA, uh, which stands for Old Growth Ecosystem Management Area and um, located in between a wildland and ecologically significant area uh, outside of any of those uh, designated wildlands or ESAs, um, but still inside the Ojima. There are, there are confirmed old growth sites within the Ojima that are limited in size and connectivity. Uh, this is typical for confirmed old growth sites in, in mainland, which, uh, which are mostly fragmented into small patches and, and confined to isolated, hard to reach areas, which were spared from intensive logging. But, uh, but due to their limited size, isolation and further degradation, degradation of uh, surrounding landscapes via fragmentation, their, their functions tend to be compromised as intact ecosystems. Therefore, most of these blocks of confirmed or good sites are managed within a much larger OGMA. Hence, hence applying these types of treatments with a primary objective of fostering old growth conditions would uh, enhance old growth ecosystem functionality, which is a recommended action in the sustainable forest management plan for Savage River State Forest. So once we were sure we have the key decision makers on board, we, we had a field trip for a group of over a dozen uh, DNR staff, including foresters, wildlife, and heritage ecologists to walk the proposed sites and discuss our ideas for the project, uh, again, pre-COVID in uh, 2019. So if you look closer into this open area, you can see there are a few areas that were clear cut. Maybe uh, two, here's one area, there's another area here. 
there's a small patch here and then few another one here. The, these were clear cut um, maybe 20 to 25 years ago, which obviously happened before designating the Ojima. And uh, these area, the study areas uh, were heavily impacted by gypsy moth infestation and is somewhat degraded. Therefore, our project team, when scoping these for project sites, uh, considered by the subject matter experts from uh, DNR, agreed this site could be used for this study and learn as a team how these uh, practices can increase forest functionality. So we are learning and are still not in the recommendation stage yet. So initially we, uh, we conducted a stand inventory to document the baseline state of the stand as, uh, and assess the habitat condition. The, uh, the inventory of, consists of a visual assessment of forest structure, the shrub, the understory, the sub canopy, the canopy layers, the wildlife habitats. We inventoried their standing trees and the seedling regeneration capacity measures of uh, coarse or debris. And these data were used to assess the health and condition of forest stands. So these are some highlights of the baseline stand inventory. So in general, the, the canopy layer of the mature study site um, was dominated by mixed oaks. Chestnut oak was more plentiful on the higher and drier sites, while northern red oak and white oak sharing the canopy on slightly more mesic sites. Uh, many healthy surviving oak trees were larger than 16 inches in dbh. We found some 30, 34 category as well. Uh, gypsy moth infestation and mortality of a mature oak canopy was evident in in both study sites uh, with many areas completely devoid of, of a mature intact canopy. Mm -hmm. So reportedly, and I'm sure many of you may remember hundreds and thousands of massive oak trees in the mountains of Western Maryland, particularly in Garrett County, suffered a severe outbreak of gypsy moth caterpillars devastating the forests in the spring and summers of 2007-2008 period. Um, this is one of those impacted areas. The tree species diversity and uh, evenness uh, was a concern. Uh, very low number of conifer trees in the stand was the primary concern, but it was expected. There were eight to, eight to 12 inch hemlock trees, like you can see in these pictures scattered throughout the study site. Due to widespread uh, gypsy moth mortality, a significant number of snags, uh, larger than 10 inch uh, DBH. There were many like uh, in the 20, 25 DBH category again as well, uh, were in the stand, which can provide food and shelter. Uh, we can provide shelter for numerous wildlife species. And it's, a, it's an important component of an old growth feature, forest. Coarse woody debris um, or the big fallen logs uh, or much of the study sites tend to be smaller because it consists of uh, mostly the smaller tops and branches of the still standing snags. The larger coarse woody debris was composed of uh, fallen snags as well. And uh, in mainly in the canopy gaps. Red maple and black birch were found in most places, uh, plots as sapling to pole size regeneration. Uh, again, as I said, like mostly in huge gaps where there weren't an intact canopy due to gypsy moth mortality. So we had the pretreatment inventory and then, then we used them to uh, design our treatments. Uh, and uh, these, are, these are some of the management practices recommended uh, under structural complexity enhancement, which, which is available in the literature. So as you can see, uh, increasing the number of snags by girdling around the stems 
to deliberately kill selected medium to large size trees is one of the recommended management practices. However, as you saw in the previous slides, there is no need to create more snags in these two sites as past gypsy moth mortality has left many large snags standing throughout the stand. So there's no action required uh, with regard to snags. Next, increasing the number of uh, volume, number and volume of down logs is another recommended management practices for uh, structural complexity enhancement. Though most of the plots recorded uh, to have smaller coarse woody debris composed of fallen branches and tops of standing snags, uh, the, the larger standing snags would replenish this pool in the future. Therefore, there is no immediate need for felling standing trees for the purpose of increasing coarse woody debris. So what we can see here is that identifying and leaving of legacy trees and creating patch reserves, which are the group of legacy trees, is the single most important action to create a old growth structure as they would provide future cavities and downed dead logs. So in, in structural complexity enhancement, identifying and leaving of legacy trees, which are in the main canopy, is the single most important action to create old growth structure. This is an important first step in developing a long-term management plan, since it is most effective to identify and enhance old growth structural characteristics already present in stand. So legacy trees are never removed from the woods. In our project at Savage River State Forest, we, we follow a minimum impact approach. There'll be no tree felling. So we would, we would use these legacy trees to work around them and give them the priority. These are left to grow larger and die, providing standing dead trees for habitat and, and eventually fall over providing a multiple multitude of habitats as large down wood on the forest floor. These can be individual trees scattered throughout the land or retained in groups to serve as patch reserves and um, an area of the stand with legacy trees dedicated to developing old growth structure in the future. So, and when making a patch reserves, uh, preference uh, was given to areas with, with large amounts of downed logs. So due to uh, a windstorm or gypsy moth mortality, there were many downed logs. Or we can group uh, trees, uh, legacy trees uh, that contain cavities or dens. Uh, we can prioritize them to establish the patch reserves. So establishing a patch reserve around these existing old growth structures would enhance their value as old growth habitat by providing contiguous forests around them that will be de dedicated to developing additional old growth characteristics. So this is one of the sites at uh, Savage River State Forest where we are currently working on marking legacy trees, identifying large snags and demarcating patch reserves. This map provides a, a spatial representation of the distribution of the old growth features in the site. You can see we have demarcated five patch reserves and uh, there's a variability among these patch reserves. Some are totally about the legacy trees, a group of trees. As, as you can see in this patch reserve, it's, it's totally about uh, legacy trees and uh, some patch reserves are uh, mainly about fallen coarse, fallen coarse wood debris with a uh, pit and mound topography, uh, so, such as this uh, patch reserve down here. We, we don't have many uh, legacy trees inside the patch reserves. There were legacy trees around, but mostly inside the patch tree, it's mainly the, uh, uh, the pit and mound topography and other features like uh, cavity trees or snags. And uh, other patch reserves are in between in character. So we have a good variability between patch reserves. 
So the, the legacy tree is marked in between these patch reserves. Uh, if you see like in these, the, the, there are five patch reserves, this is a gap. And then uh, the legacy trees in between these patch reserves will create an intact canopy, but also provide other old growth features in between. So the number of uh, legacy trees mark uh, depends on the objective. Uh, as you can remember in that uh, restoration gradient, when we have late successional character restoration as our primary objective, it's recommended to have 25 to 50% of canopy trees uh, as legacies. So, so in our project in this site, we have we selected we have marked uh, 365 legacy trees so far, and identified 186 standing snags. And for the standing snags, the average DBH was around 19 D, uh, inches. And for legacy trees, it ranged from um, 12 to 34 inches. Uh, 12 is mostly like if you find uh, hemlocks because the conifer cover in this site was a concern, we marked them as legacy tree, even if it was just 10 or 12 inches. Um, so as you can see, there's a good amount of legacy trees in this area concentrated, but there's a huge area here where we didn't see a more many legacy trees. There, there's no intact canopy. This is the area where gypsy moth infestation uh, occurred heavily. So, and there are no big trees. So what we can propose to do is like uh, do some enrichment planting. So under planting with native trees, prob probably conifers to increase age class and structural diversity and species diversity in those areas and focus on the legacy trees around here, uh, just to uh, make sure they are protected. So, uh, as I said, like majority of the marked legacy trees were chestnut oaks. Um, as you can know, like, know, chestnut oaks have a maximum lifespan of 400 years. This was followed by northern red oak and uh, white oaks. So when, when marking legacy trees and patch reserves, uh, selecting long lived species for legacy trees is, uh, is important. Uh, yeah, so so there's a lot to be done and a uh, lot to be learned. We are, we are following a demonstration approach in this project where we are creating a platform to talk to our audience in the future. We want to work with our public and private land managers, the re researchers uh, as a team to experiment, to discuss, listen to concerns and recognize our priorities and follow an adaptive management approach where we learn by doing. Uh, we expect the lessons learned from these projects to be to broaden many of forest management options on private and public lands and contribute towards having more late successional habitats in the landscape, which is, which is important for landscape scale, diversity and climate resilience. Our role is to bring stakeholders together and create a shared vision of getting the right management practices in the right places, in the right proportions. This will not be a quick and easy task, but we believe it's the path forward to restore a healthy and resilient, uh, resilient diversity of forest age classes in the Appalachians. So with that, I conclude my presentations and presentation, and um, I'm happy to have any questions, comments, or suggestions. Thank you. Thanks, Papoda. Hello, everyone. My name is Donnell Keach, uh, and introduce me at the beginning. I am the director of the Maryland DC Chapters Resilient Forest Program, and my role here tonight is to moderate the Q and A. Um, so just a reminder, uh, the, um, you can type your questions, please type your questions into the Q&A box, which is at the, along the bottom of your screen. And we've been having questions come on in here. So um, let me start with a nice juicy one, Pavoda, that'll give you a chance to 
um, explain a little bit more about uh, your thinking and our, our work on this. Question from Rick, who says, girdling trees to accelerate the death of, of, of trees that are competing with larger legacy trees seems unnecessary, perhaps detrimental, because it selects winners and looter, losers based on nothing but size. What if the competing trees have attributes that lead to longer life um, relative to the larger trees? Maybe we don't know enough about the genetics to be making those selections. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Yeah, th that's, that's in um, main, the menu of uh, the structural complexity enhancement tools. We have girdling trees, which is a, a, a preferred method instead of uh, completely cutting a tree and then dropping them down because it will have a slow death and then it will become a snag. It will have this uh, create, be created cavities providing more wildlife options, but selection of um, girdling, as you said, will be challenging to see. But when we uh, were demarcating these trees, we can prioritize. That's why the patch reserves were uh, identified. One way we can work or learn together is that like, we first focus on patch reserves, whether girdling is needed in these patches to encourage or release some of these legacy trees um, if if uh, we saw like in certain areas of the stand where girdling is not needed because the trees are doing self doing the self thing in, in itself and uh, overcoming the competition, but in certain areas where because of gypsy moth mortality we saw like there's regeneration happening, but uh, there are trees that are not giving the opportunity for some of the seedlings or in the sapling stage oaks and other preferred species to come into the mid story and then come to the game. So I think like uh, we we can learn with this one and then as you said, like genetic diversity is always a concern. Uh, and especially we know like gypsy moth mortality, when gypsy moth mortality was hit in this region, there were some oak trees that survived gypsy moth mortality. So we don't know if there's some genetic component into that. So that means like uh, protecting these ones or reserving some of these uh, trees as legacies will be important for future, to face uh, these stresses in the future. So if you want to girdle around these trees to give them more opportunity, uh, I think that's, that's something that we need to do. But again, as you said, like there's, things that we need to con be concerned of. Thanks. Donna asks, is the climax forest no longer a relevant concept? Yeah, it, it is a, I know like it, 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 it was taught in our textbooks, like, uh, but there, there are, there are arguments in that, like uh, the climax, what is climax? Well, how you say like this is the best stage and then, there's always there's disturbances, right? So, and uh, these are complex pathways, as I said. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I will leave leave it there. But it's, <laughs> I would say like there's it's a complex system. But there there are there are good uh, scientific papers like arguing that concept and then counter arguing that as well uh, mm -hmm. the concepts. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. I'm, I'm happy if there are any concerns or comments on us on that one from the audience. Yeah. Well, yeah, if you uh, if you want to weigh in on that, I know uh, I would certainly reflect on. I don't know, don't know you, but if if you're my age or older, the way the concept of uh, forest succession and a climax forest was taught when I was in school uh, has is is no longer. At particularly relevant in exactly the same way it was taught, as as Pavoda said, it's seen as a much more complex thing. So thank thank you for that question. Um, how does the presence? Eric asks, how does the presence of invasive species impact the transition to old growth forests? If there are negative impacts, what are the preferred methods to mitigate them? That, that's a very good question. I mean. That's, that's, when I say like, I just can remember like uh, not all late suction and forest 
will be suitable for this kind of management. Uh, that's an area that we can use these techniques like where there are some stresses happening and then we can do some management to control some invasive species. And um, if the invasive species uh, is impacting or stopping the succession into old growth or late successional zone. And so that's where we can use some management to control the invasives and uh, help the forest to develop these uh, characters, old growth characters mm -hmm. and accelerate the development. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that question, Eric. Uh, let's see, uh, how long do, uh, Christine asks, how long do you expect the projects at Sav Savage River State uh, Forest to, to last? And, um, and another, was it, how, how long have the projects been going on, the demo projects been going on, and how long do we see them lasting into the future? Yeah, that uh, again, uh, we started this project in, uh, what, 2000, End of, I mean, like I joined TNC in 2008, but I know like Donnell and our team was uh, grappling with this idea and then discussing this uh, concept. So I know it's, there's a big planning stage when it comes to growth or any kind of forest management project. So, um, so there, I can say like there's more than, I mean, like two to three years of planning at least by now, but when it comes to, uh, future when we say like projects like a late suction or these kind of projects won't end in five, six years, you won't achieve your targets. Like this would take on decades, but when it comes to projects, we need to have timelines, uh, achievable targets. So um, we are learning from um, our colleagues in um, New England region who have done these projects previously. And uh, they, I know like uh, they have projects that are 15 years to 20 years long right now. And what they do have like, uh, we, at the beginning, we even we said the treatments, we put up some monitoring plans, like for invasive species, that's one agreement we have with DNR. Uh, even though we implement the treatments and we can have the standing inventories conducted in every five years or later after every 10 years, but we will, uh, continue to monitor the invasive species every two or at least one year at the beginning, every year in the beginning, but then maybe like two to three years to make sure everything is intact, we are not messing up. Um, but yes, um, then um, it depends on the site, obviously, and the treatments that we're doing, it depends on the resources we have, depends on the conditions or questions we have like this one and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. These are multi-decade projects, but it, it will be broken down into several projects or pieces or parts or phases of projects, I guess. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I, I guess I answered that question as <laughs> best as I can. Yeah, yep, thank you. Thanks for the question. A uh, couple of questions coming in here about herbaceous plants and other types of plants. Do Are we looking at herbaceous plants, other types of plants other than large woody? Uh, species? Yeah, so um, there are herbaceous plants in this one, like uh, the shrubs there. Uh, but uh, when it comes to old growth or this kind of management, uh, these herbaceous, yeah, we are looking at, we are looking at the structure. We have in say like a multi-age, multi-structured uh, forest, uh, what, we, or what we want, right? And then it, there needs to be diversity in the, inside a forest stand as well. Uh, in some areas, there won't be shrubs or understory canopy, but there will be areas that is dominated by shrubs and herbs. And, and these are the places, this diversity is good. This will create more microhabitat. This will create more um, habitats for wildlife species, right? So we want to have them created naturally. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Cindy asks, is there a point where you have too many snags and dead wood? She's wondering about fire hazard. Yeah, um, yes, that's that's totally correct. Like I I didn't present that here, but we went uh, 
did a climate adaptation. I can show that slide if um, I think we have time. So um, we did a, a planning project with uh, the NIACs or the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Sciences. Um, I don't have that anymore. So what, uh, yeah, oh. it's here. Uh -huh. um, so as you can see here, um, this was, a, as I said, like this climate informed management. So what it does is like, uh, we take the management actions we have right, have, have right now, and then uh, these central labs, forest ecosystem, vulnerability assessment and synthesis develops like have climate models. And these uh, forest adaptation resource or workbook, what it does is that we went through this uh, workbook as a team and identified main site specific impacts and vulnerabilities for this site. So as you can see here, potential increase of wild high risk came as a high risk criteria because, of we, because we have too many snags. We have a lot of course of debris on the ground and the climate models predict that uh, these regions, these areas will have an escalated risk of wildfire in the future because of increase of temperature and uh, reduced soil moisture, less snow winter cover, right? So yes, there is a wildfire risk, but uh, right now we, mm -hmm. We, we are not planning to do anything at this moment. We are closely monitoring. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are still developing this project, but uh, that is a concern. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. you can say that. And I, I think the first part of Cindy's question was actually just looking for some insight in, in how much is too much. How do we know how much is the right amount of, of dead standing snags or, or downed? Down yeah. snags? Do we have some insight on that? Yeah, I can refer to this slide. Um, so even though we say like uh, there's, we don't see an immediate need for addition, uh, both for snags and course of the debris because of gypsy moth mortality we have. There are studies saying that uh, gap dynamics related to exotic in insect infestation is different from gap gaps created naturally, mm -hmm. right? And uh, because it's the death of only a single tree species. And uh, this, this, these snags, the gypsy moth infested snags remain standing longer and there's a lesser chance of creating pit and mount topographic features because of this reason. When they fall down, their root system is already decayed. So they, they won't create that typical tip and mound, uh, pit and mound uh, topography that we decide. So yes, there's a concern of like too much uh, snags, there's too much custody and then this is the same species. There's no diversity in that category. But again, when we discussed this with uh, our partners as a team, what we came was like, right now, it's not, a, it's not our main concern. We already have a lot of snags. There's wildfire risk, but right, let's let's work with this right now. We are, we are still learning. This is a learning uh -huh. process. We are not in a recommendation stage, as, as we said. So as we go, uh, we can work on that. And then uh, I'm, as part of that climate, uh, climate informed planning process, we had in fact like gap characterization is a, another priority. So we are using uh, drones and other remote sensing uh, tools to characterize the gaps, characterize mm -hmm. how much structural diversity we have in the canopy. And then with those studies along the time, like with the time we can come into some good data, get some, collect some good data and have a good conversation here for concerns and then yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question, thanks. Yeah, all right, thank you. Um, a couple questions uh, about uh, conifers. What con Liz asks, what conifer species will you plant and how will you protect them from deer? And another, um, another participant also asked about the impacts of deer and how we can, mm -hmm. um, we can guard against those. Yeah, again, yeah, uh, about the conifer species, uh, if you think about the, what's naturally existing here, we found many hemlock, hemlocks here. And uh, in part of the stand, uh, there were white pines and uh, some novice spruce. So I think like that, that gives an indication like uh, conifers can survive 
to certain extent in certain areas. So uh, we'll be looking for those ones, um, especially to enrich uh, the gaps or areas. Mm -hmm. um, what was the other part, Diana? Uh, deer, how will you protect oh, okay, deer, yeah. deer? Yeah, yeah <laughs> that, that's, that's a pretty, um, pretty good question. And then when we, surprisingly, when we did the forest inventory initially, um, deer browsing was didn't come a big issue. And then we saw a lot of uh, oak regeneration in some parts of the property. Um, and regeneration was not an issue. And then I reached out to the foresters and then asked her what was the reason for that. And then got to know like, this is a, a popular hunting spot. So probably it's keeping the hunting uh, deer pressure down for the moment. And uh -huh. I know like it, it's a deer issue is a landscape scale issue. And then uh, we cannot ignore the issue like saying like, okay, deer issue is not an issue here. And then we, because these are demonstration projects, we want to bring people here and demo like, okay, this is, this is what we are doing. And uh, we need to keep our eyes open and your eyes and ears open for the deer issue, even uh -huh. if it's not a big issue here. We don't know, like when we when we plant those seedlings, they will be they might get attracted and eat all the seedlings, you know, you know. But yeah. that, that's why we we want to have a second site at Sidling Hill Creek and another site. So that's what the replication would do uh, as we go along the process. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, a follow up on deer, and then I'm going to come back to to hemlock. Um, Patricia had also asked about uh, deer. Uh, white-tailed deer pressure, uh, their significant, their uh, influence on young tree seedlings. Someone else, uh, I think Rick mentioned oak regeneration. Mm -hmm. uh, are there apex predators for deer? Um, have we thought about ways to determine pre-colonial deer numbers? That's a little outside the scope of our project, but it sounds like folks would like to hear what you have to say on this. Uh, I I don't think I am an expert on that to answer, but uh, I will rely on my uh, our DNR partners, wildlife, mm -hmm. and DNR colleagues to weigh in on that idea on the process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. Okay. Uh, coming back to hemlock. Uh, let's see. Emily said you mentioned hemlock. What is the situation with regard to the hemlock bully adelgid? Uh, on a trip to New Germany uh, State Park recently, which is not too far from the site, I a lot, saw a lot of hemlocks that appeared to have been treated for hemlock adelgid. What do you, what, can you tell us about that? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, the, more, all, almost all the hemlocks in this particular site were very small, uh, eight to 12 inches, or maximum like 15 inches. They were extremely small. We didn't find big, larger hemlock trees here. Uh, and uh, we didn't see, and uh, you know, uh, the woody adelgid was not an uh, issue or not, was not documented uh, in this part mm -hmm. of the property. Um, now, the, even in the, we have a confirmed old growth site um, uh, as a reference um, right here. Mm -hmm. uh, they they had a, they were bigger hemlock trees, but even in there, like uh, we didn't see, it, it was not an issue. Mm -hmm. And I don't think um, um, they are treated within Ojimas. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. I need to check mm -hmm. with the uh, DNR. Kind of if... But the hemlocks at this site and, and nearest our project site don't seem to be don't seem yeah affected by the adelgid at this time yet. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, here's another question from Rick. Will opening up the canopy by girdling increase the possibility that invasive species will, will come in into the site? Yes, that's a concern. <laughs> so yeah, that's again that uh, we discussed about that uh, our, you know, at our max workshop. Uh, again, because increasing in our native plant species came as the highest priority for this site because of uh, the climate models. But uh, we didn't, even with the uh, as inventory, 
uh, baseline inventory, there were no invasive species concerns uh, within the site. But uh, during our site visits, we uh, documented some invasive species in a adjacent old logging road. So as a precautionary measure, even if it was, a, even though it was outside our project site, uh, what uh, our project team decided was like to totally eradicate that, uh, the invasives in that logging road. So we are taking control of uh, the future, where future interactions can come from, right? So uh, we did that uh, invasive species control in that old logging road and then uh, as precaution measures during that next workshop, we decided like to keep a buffer from, acceptable buffer from the, the logging road and uh, make sure like take our precautions to avoid introductions and monitoring, again, uh, a separate monitoring to, uh, program to be established like uh, for invasive species like every year, make sure like uh, the areas that we controlled uh, in the logging road is, is fine and then the same with the close area. So yeah, that will be that's a big concern. And if you're doing any management actions uh, like Girdley, uh, that will go into the monitoring plan. So we are keeping a close eye on that. Thanks. Samantha asks, have we thought about the implications of this project on forest carbon storage and sequestration? Um, I mean, I mean, like in particular terms, like we haven't decided anything that we would like to monitor anything, but uh, that's a that's one advantage of old, having old growth forests or late managing for late succession habitats, because there's there's scientific literature uh, supporting that idea, like a late succession forest management increases uh, carbon sequestration landscape scale or like in the property, uh, yeah. That, right. Yeah, that's a good one. All right, thank you. Um, are there indicator species of animals that would indicate success for these projects? Asks Brent. Thank you for that question, Brent. Um, again, I'm not the expert on that one. I'm, I'm relying on, but like for a species, uh, I'm relying on the our heritage partners for that one. We are listening to their concerns and they know like, uh, where rare and threatened species are. And then they, we, they have set some guidelines for management, like to these areas need to be demarcated and no management actions taking place. Like there are like area that has like um, long tail sh shoe habitat. And then there was a this sea page area. And then those are the areas will be kept intact and no management mm -hmm. action be came, done. But, um, um, yeah, because we are collaborating with our DNA partners, that it will be covered and concerns will be heard, I guess. Yeah. Michelle asks, could could you discuss the benefits of snags for the environment? Great, great question for if uh, to, yeah, because we talk so much about snags. Yeah, because like uh, th these snags create uh, different wildlife or habitat options for some certain bird species, certain bat species, certain um, all sorts of other uh, species, sorts of species uh, that find as refuge for habitat. So, uh, so having snags is a critical criteria for old growth or late succession habitat management. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, again, like with the specifics of the species and stuff, like I'm not an expert on that, but uh, that's the main. Uh, advantage of having snags for wildlife mm -hmm. for certain species. Yeah. Terrific, thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, Brent asks In Western Maryland, a portion of the economy is based on extraction and harvesting of resources. Do the plans, I guess uh, Brent is referring to our project plans, include any aspect of promotion? of economic benefits of a diverse forest? Uh, is it regard, um, with regard to this project or in general? 
I think uh, uh, this... you you get to answer the question, however. <laughs> <laughs> to, but, but... I, I know that, that you'd be the best person to answer that question. But oh, dear. With, with, with regard to that, uh, I mean, for this project, I, I would say, like, in terms of when you talk about uh, late suction forest management, I had a slide saying, like, there are economic, you can still have economic benefits and have some old growth component in your forest. So we are not, as I said, like, we are not promoting, or like, if we are not asking, I said like we want, we are just in the scoping stage for the, the third site where we want mm -hmm. to find a private landowner who's interested in having old growth features in their stand, in their forest, in their land. Um, but they want to have timber management extraction as their main objective. But it's, it doesn't mean that we are trying to find landowners and then trying to promote timber management. It's like, mm -hmm. a, something they need to have that as an objective because when working with private landowners it's, uh, their objectives will be the driving force right mm -hmm. so yeah uh if you want to add anything to, uh, to mm -hmm. i guess i would just build on that by saying that i, I don't think we see it as our role to um to increase or necessarily decrease uh economic management of forests. That's something that happens in some places, other places there are reserves and preserves, there's room and need for all of those activities. What I love about the way Pobota is leading this project is it's helping us learn about the way that, uh, that, that a variety of types of management, whether it includes a harvest component or includes no harvest component, can contribute to, um, to increasing habitat values at this old, older forest end of the um, end of the spectrum. But here's an interesting one for our Western Maryland colleagues. Christine asks, do you see the impact of super storm, super storm Sandy on Savage River State Forest sites? Is that something that's come up as you've met with the, the managers and the DNR folks there? Have they talked about impacts from, from the big ice and um, storm that, that came through a number of years back? Yes, but, but not this in part of the property. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, not in this uh, part. Yeah, there, there are the areas, I think, uh, that got affected. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, but uh, in this particular property, or the piece of the area, it didn't get affected. I'm not especially going to direct you like where I got. Okay, thank you very much, Papoda, for a fascinating presentation. There was definitely a lot of interest. Thanks, Donnell, for adding to the dialogue. Okay, thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.